Welcome back from lunch. You know, every year for the last four or five years, it's been like 75, 78 degrees out there. And you know, we've been freezing in here. It's a little bit warmer now. <laughs> so then we go outside and then we don't want to come back. And David and Edith and Shay, everyone's like running around trying to bring all of you back in. But you know, it's kind of a cold day today. <laughs> so you're all coming back fast and I appreciate that. I'm Claudia Coleman. And I have the honor of introducing our next guest, Richard Ellerson. Mr. Ellerson is the CEO of the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. With his past experience as an advertising executive who created campaigns for companies such as American Express and Remy Martin and penned the classic tagline, it's not TV, it's HBO, he has applied his creativity and energy and has greatly expanded the foundation's work as well as amplified its profile. Mr. Ellerson has led initiative to transform basic health care for women with disabilities, created a diverse network aimed at adapting con Connect technology to providing an innovative gaming interface for people with disabilities. And he brought an increased level of attention to the needs of people with CP through the Just Say Hi media campaign. His prior experience of being a founder and CEO of two assisted technology companies, Panther and Blink Twice, adds another skill set layer of technical competence to his foundation leadership role. The heart and inspiration of his endeavors is his 18-year-old son, Thomas. Richard and Thomas have been featured on ABC World News People of the Year, on CNBC Squawk Box, which I find interesting, and a featured covered story in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. The ABC World News Human Interest Story highlighted Richard's creative impact on his son's life. He created a com communications uh, device called Tango, and it customized responses in a kid's voice for Thomas. And it didn't sound mechanical, and it had a wide range of kid-friendly expressions like, so cool, or the sound of a whoopee cushion. <laughs> when Thomas spent time with three players of his beloved New York Times, New York Times, New York Yankees, sorry about that, the newscaster asked, what was their favorite expression on Thomas's machine? And it was unanimously the whoopee cushion. <laughs> You know, that is such a guy's thing. I don't understand that. <laughs> the kid-friendly form of speech technology of Tango normalized Thomas in the eyes of the kids his age. He could be interactive and have fun with his answers. Richard has been honored with the 2012 Visionary Leadership Award from Resources for Children with Special Needs. He also received the caregiver of New York, of Caregiver of the Year of United Cerebral Palsy of New York City. He has served on the Advisory Council of the NIH's National Institute on Deafness and Communication Disorders. He has been the recipient of two NIH grants. And it is an absolute delight for me to introduce and to welcome Richard Ellerson. Richard. so odd to like look up there and just see me and my kid up there. It's, um, he's a very, very special guy. Um, so thanks so much for having me here. It's really, really fun and wonderful to be here. Um, I, I just want to say thank you to the Coleman's. Um, putting on a conference is a mixture of energy, excitement, vision, and exhaustion. <laughs> sort of like being at a conference. But to have people who will lead that vision, add to the energy and excitement, and help this group not have that level of exhaustion is really amazing. Conferences are such critical things in our world. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me and for doing this for everybody. Um, I want to say this is the most extraordinary time for people with disabilities and for technology and for people with disabilities and technology and how they come together. And I'm so appreciative to get to share this with all of you today. The world is crazy amazing. 
Everything is moving at speeds we cannot possibly comprehend. If you imagine something, it is going to happen. And it might not happen tomorrow. And it might not happen as quickly as you'd want it. But oddly, it will happen more quickly than you really think it can. And certainly, if you think what you might have thought was possible 18 months ago, and you ask yourself that same question today, 18 months later, you'll have a totally different answer. And how crazy is that? But technology is not just the whiz-bang power of computers, telecommunication, and maybe one of these days, teleportation. It's the subtler stuff, too. It's how we leverage what's already available, how we put things together, and our understanding of how people actually use things. And that's the critical thing that we know that the rest of the world doesn't know, how we actually use things. And in the world of disabilities, how we get the everyday world, which is so deeply rooted in a different cognitive and physical reality than we are, how to get them to understand us. How do we get those people to make things for us? The engineers, the scientists, the product guys. How do we get them to see not only that we count, not only that we are a market, but that so much of what they're doing today can be used for us and by us if they start by building it in, as we've talked about, and oddly, by just evolving things so we can access them better. How do we figure out how to do this? So let me start with something that's happening today in Pittsburgh that some of you probably know about. Uber has a fleet of self-driving taxis in Pittsburgh. I'm getting, I've got this little wire that's coming at me here. I'm going to move it. So imagine a fleet of self-driving taxis going on in Pittsburgh. I mean, who would have thought about that? But this is what I see. What I see are the changes that can happen for people with disabilities. I see my son, who is in a wheelchair and who is nonverbal, leaving our home, using the Bluetooth connection in his iPad to tell that van to open up the ramp in the back. I see him going into the, into the van. I see the easy lock hitting as soon as he does it. I see him hitting his iPad and saying, I want to go to a restaurant and, and picking the restaurant. And the iPad speaks it, and the car knows where it's going, and it starts itself off, and off he goes. And then I see him hitting an address book and deciding which of his five girlfriends he's going to ask to meet him there. <laughs> and the most wondrous thing, he can do it without me. <laughs> Cars that drive themselves. Phones that tell us when we leave a room that we forgot to call somebody back. Dogs that have chips implanted inside of them. So if your dog runs away, we can find him with, with technology. Cameras everywhere. People sitting in bars, looking at their phones to find out what better party there is at another bar. Going to that bar and then Instagramming that I'm at a better party. Someone sees it who calls them and then they leave to go to the next. You spend your whole life going from bar to bar, never enjoying the moments that you're in. That's the world we live in. And it's not all bad, and it's not all good, but it is the world we live in. But what that means for us in the world of disabilities is that we already have so much of what we need right now. So how do we leverage these opportunities? Let me tell you a little bit about myself first. That's called the waiting game. Um, let's see. Um, first, I'm the CEO of the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. And let me take a moment to tell you about what our mission is. Is there a slide I can see on one of these, by the way? No? OK. So I'm going to turn my back to you a little bit now and then. So we decided that there's a specific problem. People with disabilities so often don't get the supports and interventions they need at the moments that they need them. We've all experienced that. What happens then? Lives are often lived with significant and unnecessary challenges. And that's why we're in this room because the challenges are not necessary. Our mission is to transform the lives of people with cerebral palsy and related disabilities today through research, innovation, and collaboration. And we're addressing that issue powerfully and collaboratively. I'll share some of this as we go along today, but we're partnering with everybody from Microsoft to the New York City Department of Education, to Fashion Institute of Technology, to Harvard, UCLA, Columbia, Northwestern, Hopkins, doing amazing work. And actually, I'm a New Yorker, but I'm coming today from Seattle, where I spent the last day and a half at Microsoft. 
And I've got to tell you, you heard it from Tom, but that company is doing amazingly wonderful things. We met with all their folks, we got to see what's going on, and every building we walked into, there was a poster with Satya Nadella's quote about how important accessibility is and how we need to deal with the needs of the individual. It's really, really special. And they're embracing partnerships with foundations. They're working tightly with us now, working with the Gleason Foundation, and everybody is excited. I've, been, I've known those guys for a decade, and it's a completely different environment there. I'm also the father of Tom. He's 18 now, he has CP. He uh, uses a wheelchair. I'm trying to do this, there we go. He uses a wheelchair. This is my favorite picture I ever took of my kids, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, that, and that's still their relationship, my daughter preening and my son smiling at her, that sort of how it goes. Um, his, his sister and his relationship is honestly the most gratifying thing in my life watching the two of them get along the way I got along with my sister, watching them understand each other and build kindness and support and insight and activity and accomplishment is amazing. Tom's got a lot of friends too, but to be honest, in the world of disabilities, making friends is a little bit harder. Keeping friends is a little bit harder because when you want to go to a pizza parlor and there's a step and you can't get there, when you have a cognitive disability and you take a little longer to tell someone exactly what you want to do, it's hard for kids to learn to wait. Time is the biggest issue we have in this world. But mostly, Tom loves theater. That's Andrew Lloyd Webber, for those of you who can't tell by the baggy eyes. Um, he loves theater. He knows so many people in New York City. He's embraced by the theater world. And one of the most wonderful things, Jefferson Mays, who was in... Uh, He's won a Tony and he was in the uh, Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, wrote a recommendation for Tom for school and said, Tom's wheelchair used not as support, but as a foundation from which he takes his flights of imagination. And Jordan Roth, who's a big theater guy in New York said, you know, he found the right world because everyone in the theater world wants to know why you're different, not why you're the same. And that's something we should all take with us, Jordan's words, which are pretty, pretty spectacular. But mostly, he's just a bright, engaging, fun kid who deals with his challenges and says to me, Dad, you're smart, but I'm smart and charming. <laughs> Tom said I could only use these photos of him if I let you know he has a website called theaterific.com. <laughs> he has a Twitter handle called Theaterific. And if 10 people here don't go on and friend him by the end of this talk, or you can do it after if you want to pay attention, that's OK, too. <laughs> but, but if 10 people don't do this, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble from my son. So I hope you all do it. Theaterific, one R, two Fs, theaterific, terrific, theater, et cetera. Um, and again, what Tom does, he reviews shows, he goes to shows. And, and I don't know if you guys know Michael Cerverus, who is a huge Broadway guy. Tom just did a project in school yesterday um, and he sent Michael an email and said, I need you to do a video for me. <laughs> and, and Michael's service is like doing for our fifth grade class, doing a little video of what Tom thinks of Fun Home. It's like nuts. It's fantastic. Um, I also, before this, I spent my early career in advertising, as, as was mentioned before. And, um, you know, I worked on Kellogg's, McDonald's, American Express, wrote It's Not TV, It's HBO. The thing about It's Not TV, It's HBO, it took me three months and a lot of bourbon to write it. And it was advertising back then. But five words, which means you don't need volume to have impact. So many people always think we just need to write and write and talk and talk and talk. I mean, what, what, when the moment you fall in love, it's not the moment you give someone a 20 minute talk about why you love them. It's when you look at someone across the table, your eyes meet and you touch their hand and you go, wow, I guess we're in love. You don't need that much. And that's one of the keys to this world of disabilities and technology. Less is more. Um, I'm also an advocate. About 15 years ago, I had taken out all of Tom's um, teachers and paraprofessionals. And for those of you who've dealt with a family who have a kid under five years old, you don't have a picture of your family without a PT, an OT, an SLP, a CET, a paraprofessional. I mean, my family picture has like 18 people in it, and we're a family of four. It's really odd. But I took them all. I don't know if you've all seen this movie, King Gimp, about this guy, Dan Keplinger, who's an amazing painter. And he was having an exhibit in New York. So I took all of Tom's therapists out to dinner. And right as Patrick Bruni said to me, there's nowhere in the city for your kid to go to kindergarten, 
Mary Bloomberg walked by. So I said, well, when the voice is that loud, you'd better answer. And I introduced myself, and I told him what the issue was. And he said, well, here's my card, and call me tomorrow. <laughs> and, and I called him, and he set me up with the deputy mayor. And, you know, Mike Bloomberg, biggest heart in the world, you know, and, and, and a strong metal heart that knows how to beat the right way and stay on course. The guy is amazing. Um, and, and he started us off on the thing, and we started a program in the New York City schools um, at one classroom, and I actually had to go pick the people from the preschools by myself, because the city wasn't ready for that. And we started a program that is still going on today. And about two months before the end of the, um, end of the year, I was talking with Lisa Belkin, who wrote the article, she's an amazing writer, and I, I said to her, I said something, she goes, well, you know, it'll be a cover story, you know, I don't do anything but cover stories. And I'm like, whoa, Tom is gonna be on the cover of the Sunday New York Times. This is the holy grail. My kid, this is gonna do it. And about a week later, I wake up in the middle of the night and I said, this is not the holy grail, this is the starting gun. And here I am, 13 years later, still running. Our foundation does some really amazing videos, and there's this one woman who said, you need to be positively persistent. And I think sometimes you shouldn't be positive, but it works better. But persistence is the only thing that works in this world. It's the only thing that will work for your kids, only thing that will work for the people you work with. It's the only thing that will work for you. Nothing happens quickly. Finally, my, my work took me to the field of assistive technology. You know, I love that stuff. I had an HP 35, which was, you know, way more money than an iPhone is today. And it could actually add and subtract where you had to do, you know, four, enter, two plus, things like that. Um, but everything came together for me with assistive technology because I don't know if you've heard the term social capital. It means, you know, how do you come across? The way we dress, we're we wearing a suit, we're we wearing an open collar, we're we wearing a sweater. Or, you know, the way we present ourselves is so important. And the technology out there wasn't presenting ourselves the way anybody would really want to be presented. We had stick figures of people, you know. I mean, we have enough cognitive and physical issues in this world to begin with. As a community, we owe it to all those folks to dress them up the right way and help them choose things and help them understand style and substance and things like that. And we don't do it. We say, oh my God, I gotta get out to go to the restaurant and you put sweats on your kid and you do this and, 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 you, and these things matter and you go into hospitals and the great ones now have beautifully colored walls and the other ones have this gray drab stuff and you walk in and what are your expectations? What are your expectations when someone shows up at your house for a date and they're wearing a running suit? How about when they're wearing a red? I always think like if, if, if you know, Harrison Ford showed up at your house for a date and started making fun of you, you'd be really upset. But if Rodney Dangerfield showed up and was serious, you'd be just as upset. Because we all have our expectations, and we need to change those expectations. So the first thing I did was create a speech device called the Tango. And um, this is the story of that. Finally tonight, our person of the week. There probably isn't a parent out there who hasn't had trouble communicating with their child at some point. But imagine if it were a daily challenge, even an impossibility. Then you can begin to appreciate the challenge that faced one father and how extraordinary was his solution. There's so much going on in his head. He, uh, Thomas sees everything, he observes everything, he's aware of everything. Thomas Ellenson has cerebral palsy. This eight-year-old is right on course academically with his fellow about-to-be third graders, but he's verbally limited. Thomas can say yes and no, but not much more, which doesn't mean there's nothing going on in his head or in his heart. You are living the same life that everybody else is. You're just maybe not commenting as much, you're not expressing as much, and people should never mistake that for not understanding as much. Thomas was trained to use a traditional speaking device, but it was tedious to express thoughts one word at a time, and he gave it up. His dad, a successful advertising man, thought he had a better idea. What became important to me was to try to come up with ways for kids to communicate quickly, to quickly tell you what they're interested in, to quickly tell you they're happy, they're unhappy. Richard devoted his energies to creating a kid-friendly form of speech technology he named Tango. The gadget pre-records a wide variety of colorful pictures and depicting commonly used actions, questions, and emotions. You cheated. I cheated? How? So Thomas can quickly select a thought, and the little computer will speak it for him. 
in a voice much like his own. Let me do it. When you listen to a robotic voice, it is harder to remember what I am saying to you right now because there is no beat, there is no cadence. If I'm talking to you like this again, you're inside my emotions, you're following me. It's a handy way for an eight-year-old to express unwieldy emotions as well. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to dance? <laughs> The Ellensons made sure that Thomas has a full range of expression at his fingertips. He can go into a mode on, with one push of a button and change that from a regular voice to a whine or a shout or a whisper. Please, please get that for me. There will be a lot of things on voice output devices that you'll want to delete because later we have to add, you know, I hate you, mom. You know, we've already added, dad, you're bugging me, um, which is one that he loves to hit. You would love to delete all those, but you would love to delete them on your typical kids too, and you don't have that choice. Here's how the Ellensons get ready for a baseball game, recording customized cheers in a human voice. Let's go Cyclones! At the stadium, no one sees a kid stuck in a wheelchair. He's just one of the guys hollering for his team his way. If there's one thing I want to change in the world, it's to assume that someone in a wheelchair has a headline over their head, which does not say my life is difficult, but which says my life is interesting, my life is fun, and in some cases my life is triumphant. And so we choose Richard Ellenson and his son Thomas. Richard says he hopes his invention, Tango, will soon give the hundreds of thousands of Americans who need help speaking new voices of their own. That is World News for this Friday. I'm Charles Gibson. For all of us at ABC News, good night. Thanks so much. Um, I heard that when th that, that finished, Charlie said, we need to do more stories like that. And I've obviously seen that video more than a few times. This is the first time I realized that when Tom says that thing, it's embarrassing. I always thought it, he was responding to me, asking him to dance and saying, no, it's embarrassing. I just realized this time right before that I had been dancing. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got to tell him when I get back. <laughs> Not quite as bad as Elaine, but you know. Um, anyhow, so the, so the tango was cool, and it was featured on Industrial Design Magazine. There are tangos in the Liberty Science Museum. They were in the German um, Museum of Design. It was really cool, but right after we launched, something a little cooler came out. Uh, this thing. <laughs> and, and think of that. It is, it is just its 10th anniversary, because it was introduced in lots of, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I was in my elevator in New York holding a, a, a Walkman and a, or an iPod and a phone and a black, Blackberry and going, why don't these things all come together? And the answer is because it's hard. Tech isn't as easy as you think it is. You can't just like zzz and put it together. It took a long time to get the interface right, and these guys did. And again, you know, I know a lot of guys at Apple, and you know, I don't think anyone understood exactly what would happen. Everyone sort of knew. But exactly what happened is crazy in only 10 years. And my, my, I made my assistant, I said, Pat, I'm never going to do this to you again, but you need to get up at 2 AM. You need to be at the Apple store and get this thing when it comes out. And he got it. We brought it back. And my CTO ran into my office and said, oh my god, do you realize we could put the tango on this? And I said, Tom, don't tell a soul. <laughs> <laughs> those of you in business, you know, it was not a good thing for us. And, um, but it was still small, so you needed to have really good motor control to use it. And then um, I was talking to some of my buddies who do publishing in New York, and they said, guess what's coming out this thing? <laughs> and I walked up to Dynabox at the show who'd always been trying to buy me, and I said, you know, maybe now's the time if you really want to buy us. And I was one of the first people who actually saw what was going to happen to this world. It was, it was crazy. And of course, you know, many of you know about Proloco to Go, which was the first time someone put an app onto an, uh, you know, uh, created an app that was a speech generating device. And the truth is, are they really different? I mean, you know, I mean, they're, they're touch screens that you hit buttons and it talks. You know, it's the difference. People don't really understand. And this is one of the things that we need to be really careful of in this world. There is hardware, there is software, and there is content. And the biggest issue in terms of having access, whether it's cognitive access, motoric access, or other access, is that people don't delineate between content, software, and hardware. You think that a speech device is different than a tablet when all that's different is the box that it's in. You can create a durable box and put it around an iPad. 
People forget that the organization of language is content, not software. People forget that different access devices are not as complicated as they think when you put them apart. And we'll be talking about that in a little bit because that is the secret to changing our world. Um, so two things I anticipated happening. One of them was this. Apple stock went crazy, and you know, it, it still has. And so did Dynavox, but in the other direction. And I'm happy to say that these days, you know, they've, they've merged with Toby and they're in much better shape and they've really turned into being a good company. I've got a lot of friends there, so I don't mean this slide to be anything accepting that you can't sustain something that's not a great product. Two other things that are happening right now. Some of you may have heard of Vocal ID. This is where the world of speech devices is going. This fabulous woman, Rupa Patel, she's a, um, a, you know, a university person. She's taking voices that sound a little like yours. And she's making that person do enough of, the way you create a synthetic voice is you just speak about 700 words or something like that. It takes about two days and you get enough of the vowels and synonyms and the way it goes together so you can create a voice. So then she takes a couple of layers of voice and then she takes the person who can speak going ah, ah, you know, whatever voices they can make and, and filters it and merges those things together so you get a voice that actually sounds like yourself. How much is, I mean, on the tango, what we did is, I don't know if you heard the Let's Go Cyclones, it had a speech morph in it, which would sort of like, you know, change the, the, the frequency so it sounded more like a kid, so a kid didn't have to sound like their parent. But this is a whole nother thing. It's really, really cool. And so that's one of the future things that are happening as we start merging technologies. Something else that you might have heard about is called thought to speech. That one day in the not too distant future, we will be able to think and words can be synthetically produced for us. So you all know, many of you probably know about, you know, computer brain interface, CBI, and you know, people, you can put electrodes in someone's head and they can run a wheelchair. It's a little bit invasive, but it can be done. And when they figure out how to do it in a less invasive way, it probably will be done. But we will have a time when we can actually think and speak. So DARPA, you know, which many of you know, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which has all the really dark science and does all this cool stuff. Um, most of it you don't want to know about, it scare the heck out of you. Um, it, you know, allowed my son and I to use a prototype of a thought-to-speech device and take it home for a day and use it. So I just want you to see, you know, where the technology can go and some of the issues that we might be having in the future. So that's not really, that's his paraprofessional off on the side doing the talking, but... <laughs> just in case that wasn't clear. But that will be an issue. Because what do you do when you're talking to someone and go, whoa, look at that. You know, I mean, these are the issues. How do you decide what not to say? Tech is not as simple as it thinks, to, as you think, to get a great user interface. So, oh my God, the future happened yesterday, but why does it always feel like it's receding before us? Let's take a moment to look at what is driving success and driving challenge. To access the future, you need things that are doable, understandable, and scalable. And these are some things that you can look at. A realistic vision has to have a clearly understood need. If it's not, people aren't going to want to build it. People aren't going to want to use it. It has to have readily available mass market technology. The cost of building something is ridiculously expensive, even today, even with 3D modeling. And to do it the right way, in a way that many people can use it, is very, very difficult. You've got to do that. You need an available distribution channel. I mean, something is great if it's in a room. There's a woman, Janice Light, who works in the world of Allcom, and she says, we've been asking ourselves the wrong question for the last decade. We're asking people, we're teaching them to speak in a room with a clinical therapist. That's not how people speak. They talk with their friends in a pizza parlor. It's a very, very different thing. So we need a distribution channel that can get things out of the lab and into the world. We need a strong and intuitive user interface and user experience, otherwise it won't get adopted, and we need a vibrant ecosystem already in place. What was wrong with Dynavox during that time? There was an understood need and there was a fine product, but was there mass market technology? No, so you're charging over $10,000 for something. Was there available distribution channel? No, you needed to have a speech therapist, do an evaluation, apply to Medicaid, apply to the state, apply to the school, go through processes, you would be lucky to get a product in four months. 
Was it a strong and intuitive user interface? Not really. People didn't know how to use it. It would sit 90% abandonment. And finally, there was not a vibrant ecosystem in place at all. There weren't nearly enough therapists. Look what happened when you had the iPad, however. You had mass market technology. You had the iPad. You could buy a speech app as quickly as you could buy a weather app all of a sudden. All you had to do was go to a store, buy a tablet, and load it up. You had a distribution channel, your computer. You could say, I want to get something, and in two minutes, you could have it loaded onto your iPad. You had a really strong and intuitive user interface and user experience, partly because the tech was getting better, but partly because all of a sudden, everyone was buying this thing, and they're just hitting squares on it to get to where they want to go. A lot easier to understand what a speech device is because you're already doing it. So as we become more Borg-like, the world will become more understandable to us. Those of you who speak into Siri or into you know, Cortana or into whatever the other one is, um, you know, we are going to adapt our speech to speak a little differently so we don't have the mistakes happening in the voice translation. There's going to be that sweet spot where what we do and what the tech does sort of come together. But we didn't really have the vibrant ecosystem in place, and that's why we still don't have this problem solved. Um, let's take a minute to look at another key trend that's happening today and how the world of IDD can leverage mass market breakthroughs in inclusive access. What does that mean? You've all heard of inclusive and universal design, and we tend to think of it as an elevator. When you go into an elevator, you've got Braille next to the numbers for blind people. You've got a ding as you pass each floor also for blind people. You have an LED panel which shows floor numbers for people who need to see instead. You have doors that open at appropriate intervals and won't close for people who are in wheelchairs or things like that. All that's built into the elevator. But tech is so much cooler because we can have more than one doorway into anything. It can have different doors for people with cognitive disabilities and different doors for motor disabilities. It can change speeds. It can change features all seamlessly because it's fluid. Here's an example of how people with disabilities could maybe run their PCs or their iMacs more easily by leveraged tech with a simple app that changes everything, by using the iPad as a trackpad and giving different people different ways to use it. Um, th th this is a product that I'm involved with, I need to say that. I need to say the language of the voiceover sounds a little commercial, but I'm a commercial guy. And I need to say that the person using the device is probably going to look familiar to you all. But what I want you to think of is what access really can be with today's technology. Introducing Panther Connect. It's a revolutionary new way to access your computer. If you have trouble with motor movement, Panther Connect's innovative new interface can turn your iPad into a powerful portal and unleash all the power of your computer. Control your computer's cursor and improve navigation. Control a variety of mouse clicks, all with one touch. Launch any of your applications and switch between them. Open, save, and print documents. Edit documents with intuitive and powerful controls. Even control iTunes. Panther Connect offers five different ways to control your cursor, and each interface addresses a different motor challenge. Basic mode gives you a large area to use for easier navigation, and some powerful and accessible shortcuts. Two axis means that no matter how your hand moves, the cursor moves in just two directions. If you've got a bit more motor ability, 4-axis mode allows the cursor some more freedom. And check it out! Split-screen mode. You can move the cursor quickly across the screen. Then touch the other side of the iPad to get the cursor to move slowly. There's also a mini track for folks who need small movements and powerful commands at their fingertips. Innovative access. Universal design. Different interfaces for different needs, and powerful one-touch commands that everyone can use. Double-click, click-and-drag, shift-click, and edit. With the touch of a button, you can cut and paste, delete, even copy. Want document management? Panther Connect gives you amazingly accessible ways to open files, save files, even navigate file menus. Panther Connect can give anyone great new ways to control their computer. 
with everything from new ways to moving a cursor to new ways to accessing all your documents. Panther, unleash your potential. Music dies out. Um, so again, just think of that. You know, instead of spending $1,000 for five different controllers, instead of having kids who can't access it, think of someone who has cognitive disabilities kind of moving across the screen where you just go in one direction and you get closer to where you're getting. Think of someone with motor abilities who, can, who, who doesn't want to have to go little by little by little by little to get all the way across the street, screen. You can get quickly there and do that, all with simple software, all with a computer you have and an iPad you have. As we start bundling things together a little bit differently, as we start asking ourselves not what will you build for me, but what have you already built for me that I can tweak a little bit, we can make amazing things happen. One of the most magical moments I've ever had in my life was explaining screens and operating systems to Thomas. And although what I'm gonna say now is something we probably all know, either actively or instinctively, it's still striking to be reminded of the power of technology. We have screens now where the technology is so thoughtfully created that we feel that we're swiping down a list of things. We feel that we're opening up pictures. We feel that we're tapping things and going into other worlds and playing games. Whereas all we're doing is we're taking this small screen and changing the colors of pixels. It is so beautifully done, that you actually think you're doing something instead of just saying, change this pixel from RGB 12, 12, 100, you know, to, to RGB something else. That's all that's happening. When you stop a movie from playing on your iPad, there is a program that is always running in the back of your movie, which says if someone touches the screen, take pixels that will form a pause and a forward and a back and brighten them up. That's what's happening. The illusion of technology is so good that we don't even realize what's happening. And virtual reality, as we heard earlier this morning, you'll be hearing about more and more in years, and, and our foundation is working on, a, on a, a VR thing of being what it's like to be in a wheelchair and going down the street. If you saw speeches two weeks ago, you got to see what JJ is looking at all the time from that level. Um, but again, uh, so how can we bring this innovation to speech generating devices, which have come down in price enormously and which have become a lot faster, but really, has there been that much innovation since the first devices came out a long time ago? They're simple grid-based systems. How can we do things a little bit differently? Again, a product I'm associated with, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about it really quickly, but Total Talk is based on using the pixels differently. It starts like everything does. It has a grid of, of icons, and it has you know, deletes and speaks and things like that. And again, it has another version for kids who don't have the physical or cognitive abilities. It has a much bigger grid with much bigger symbols. And the, the, the thing on the left side, your left side, is, um, it, it is simple down as well so for people to use it. All we're doing there is changing grids and pixels on a piece of hardware that already exists. Well, when I go into an interview, I speak one way. When I go out on a dinner with my wife, I speak another way. When I'm giving a talk, I speak another way. When I'm at a ball game or tell a joke, I speak another way. Why can't we give those abilities to kids with disabilities? So what we have in Total Talk are all these different ways of speaking. We have easy phrases where there's just phrase-based language for someone who might have cognitive abilities, difficulties, or wants to just speak more quickly. We have jokes. The biggest problem with speech devices, if you ask me, is you can't tell a joke. You know, why, did, the, chicken, not so great. So you can't do it, so what do we do? At the end of it, when you tell the punchline, there's a but a bum and there's a laugh track. So don't try to be equal, try to be equivalent. There are photo albums where you can take the photos and put it, it's all built in there. There's school lists, there's stories. When you're up there, when you're doing a story, which is like a phrase-based story, so like sort of, um, you know, I want to tell you about Abraham Lincoln. He was the 16th president of the United States. He got shot in the temple, not the Jewish temple. You know, things like that. That, that actually was in the joke section. Sorry. Um, it was my son's joke. Um, but, but again, when you're doing that, you're probably up in front of a classroom. And you're probably nervous. 
And if you're speaking and you're nervous and you have any physical disability, you're probably going into extension, which means it's really hard to hit the buttons you want. So at the bottom of that mode here, there's a big long bar and you just keep tapping it and tapping it. It goes from speech to sentence to sentence. Why can't we think through all of our technology that way? Because we know what our kids need and we know what our adults and spouses need and we know what people with disability needs and why can't we just build it into a technology simply and not always demand that someone does it for us? It's not that expensive anymore. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be demanding it all, but it does mean there's other ways to look at it. And finally, when you have a cognitive disability, there's other things we can take advantage of as well. So one of the things that Total Talk has, it's called Teleprompt. You've all seen John Madden do it. Well, I guess not him anymore. But you see people do it on, on football games. So you can have a kid working on their iPad, doing their language, and a teacher can be standing there on the other side of the room watching everything the kid does on her iPhone. And you can draw an arrow and say, here's the button. You can tap on it, and it will just sort of like send little signals. And I, I just didn't want to make too many slides about Total Talk because it's not about that. But again, these are technological advances that are within our reach and that frankly should be put into every device that's out there. So we give people with disabilities the opportunities to have better supports to do the things that we all want to be doing today. What other future things are there out there today? This is probably my favorite part of this presentation that I put together, is many of the advances in the world today don't come from technology as technology. They come from manufacturing and distribution breakthroughs in technology. The world is changing like crazy. Many of the biggest changes come in how things get to us how we get to things and how we put them together and the way things are made. And what does that mean to us? How, can't, how come we can't move things more quickly with corporations? It's happening and here's why. Remember the king of beer? Budweiser was the king of beer and that was really cool. And then remember they introduced some other stuff like light beers. So all of a sudden there was Miller Lite and Bud Light, and then this guy Sam Adams came along and he started making this beer that was a craft beer. And all of a sudden there was really cool and there was Foster's. And like, wow, there's a beer from Australia, you know, Australian for beer mate, and it came in a big can. That was so different. Today, if you wanted to show every beer that's made, you would need a shelf that is over a half a mile long. <laughs> over a half a mile, and I'm not exaggerating. You'd want to know where is the beer made? Is it an IPA? Is it a lager? Is it Gosa, which I've just tried recently. It's delicious. Does it use a lemon or a lime? Or are you supposed to put an orange in the beer? All these crazy things. But the reality, of course, is that Anheuser-Busch now has 100 brands, and Sam Adams has 100 brands. What you have are mega companies making smaller batches of things and using their own resources to do it. And what that means is there's a new production paradigm. There's something called microproduction. What microproduction does is allows you to amortize your costs along different product lines. So you can have the same beer vat making five different beers. You can distribute through direct in a different way because the same guy is bringing those beers to your, to your store. And you can have innovative customizations. You can say, well, let's, I mean, look at, look at Frito-Lays. Why did they have like, you know, some, some taco bean kind of mango chip? You know, and you tried it, and everybody wanted to try it because it's new. They don't even tell you what's in the bag now, right? They have what, which of these plastic bags do you want? One, two, or three. See if you can tell what they taste like. And of course, none of them have any real flavors. But that's how cool the world is. You can make that stuff. So what is that going to mean for our world? It's going to mean some amazing stuff. And I want to start by showing you what it can mean in the world of fashion and dress. And I want to start by showing you an event that our foundation held this summer um, that was really beautiful. Having a disability has affected me as a person because I had to learn to adapt at a very young age. The world was not going to change for me and I couldn't physically change for the world. Design for Disabilities is a fantastic competition that we envisioned. We're working with Fashion Institute of Technology and we had students designing outfits for women with disabilities and Tom Brown has been our mentor. Through judging, we chose the five um, students that really not only functionally had interesting designs, but really designs that were worthy of a Children are born with cerebral palsy because they've had damage to their young brain. I have issues 
with my balance and chronic pain and fatigue. Fashion, I haven't really paid attention to it um, in a positive way because it's always been very difficult to find clothes that fit right. Designer usually just put it what they like to do and then use model as just the figure, but I want them to wear clothes, not the clothes wearing them. Uh, adaptive clothing doesn't have to look adaptive. It can look like normal clothing. It feels wonderful and it's beautiful. We talked about um, the pant being wide enough so it could fit over it because I don't always want to show my brace. And we also put magnetic closures so I wouldn't have to worry about buttoning up and buttoning down. People didn't really think I was capable of having an interest in fashion. Whatever their expectations may be, I feel like tonight just subverts that. It's such a monumental thing. It's just like, all right, I'm gonna strut down the runway. <laughs> just because I'm sitting in a chair don't mean I can sh not switch my hips. I can switch my hips. Year's prize is Grace Elizabeth. I felt a change when I saw my models. They were so confident, and I just could see that they felt beautiful and empowered. With the crowd that was here tonight, there were people in the fashion industry. I'm hoping that it will motivate them to create designs for people of different abilities, people with different body types. This competition is about changing the way we look at people. Fashion changes the way we look at everybody. It should also change the way we look at people with disabilities. Tonight is about us and telling us that we are beautiful. We're not beautiful despite our disabilities. We're beautiful because of our disabilities. Thanks. Um, it was a, a special night. It was a special experience to be part of that initiative that went on for so long. And the night was amazing, but it's not really amazing if you wake up the next day and nothing happens. So what's incredible is there's a, a company called Rent the Runway, which many of you might know of. It's an online thing. You rent dresses for special occasions and for everyday wear. And we are partnered with them and they will be announcing at the end of this year in time for the holidays, a design for disabilities tag on all the clothes that meet the requirements that we had built into all these dresses. And women with disabilities are gonna have a place to get outfits sent to them without leaving their home. There's a friend of mine, Mindy Shire, who's amazing. You might have also heard of Runway of Dreams. She had a kid with disabilities, and she went to Tommy Hilfiger because she was from the Fashion Institute. Tommy has two kids with autism. She said, how do we make clothes that are just easier to get on for people? So they've created this whole line of clothes called Runway of Dreams, where instead of buttons, you've got little magnets, where, where the, the, the lengths are better, where you can get things on. They're a little less, you know, a little baggier and things like that, and they're incredible. And you can get those online today. And Nike, there's this guy, Matt Walzer, who's a kid who lived in Florida, who emailed Nike and said, How, I can't get your shoes on. I have CP, but I have, you know, I want to wear your shoes. And so they have these fly shoes that you can open with a zipper in the back. So if you have a pronate foot, it can still get in there. And then you can still wear cool sneakers like everyone else. So you got a mom wearing a dress from Rent the Runway, going with her kid who's wearing Tommy Hilfiger and Nike flies out with everybody. And this is all happening because we can now do a run of clothes where you get almost to the very end and they say, don't put it down the button line, put it down the magnet line. 
where Nike can say to all these guys, you're making all these parts for the sneakers and you're making all these colors, make this back a little differently and just slap it onto the thing. Where you're going and you're doing all this work to find out what you, know, you need to make as an, an evening outfit and then saying, well, you know what? We had a bigger arm, we had a waist that didn't cinch and we had a different measurement there. We can do that. So all of this is happening not only because of vision, but because of microproduction that is going on everywhere. And that microproduction is not only limited to here. While we were watching that, I could have gone onto my phone. There's also the internet of things we've all talked about. I could have gone onto my phone. I could have turned the lights on in the front porch. I could have turned on the hot tub, probably a little too early. And I could have changed the temperature in my house, all from my phone. We can do all these things. And what does that mean? That means that there's a new NICU at Children's Hospital in Washington and in other hospitals around this country. And this is designed by a group of really brilliant people headed by Victoria Gallo and Anna Penn. And you can now go on rounds with the doctors in the NICU. They take you into the meetings because there's so much better information. Doctors are present electronically. You have a video camera where you can watch your kid. And having been in a NICU for 12 days, and many people have been in there a lot longer, it is real. You know, I'll never forget the day you know, after Laura, you know, we had Tom going home and having dinner at a Chinese restaurant and going, you just gave birth yesterday. Like, where's our kid? The kids in the NICU were eating Chinese food. It didn't taste good. Um, but now, how much easier to go home to know that you can watch your kid on your iPhone? How much better for a doctor to walk out of room and know if there's a SAT monitor that he will be notified immediately? How cool that you can have EKGs and EGs and all these things that are beyond my level, you know, done with movable machines? And how nice that the rooms have been made to look a little prettier? All because technology is allowing us to do these things what goes on there in the Internet of Things, and what goes on in the manufacturing process are changing the world for us. So let me end with something else that's pretty amazing. The future as brought to you by the good folks in Madison Avenue. Um, there's a campaign that, um, called Just Say Hi that our, campaign, uh, that our foundation has been able to put out, and it's only able to be doing this because of the technology that's out there today. The campaign is simple. It addresses that really awkward moment when you first meet someone with disabilities and you don't know what to say. There's a guy, Zach Anner, who some of you may know. He's an amazing comedian. He had a show on the Oprah Winfrey Network. And what Zach does is he says, people are so worried, should I say it's disabilities, it's a person with disabilities, special needs, that what people do is they just walk by you. So we came up with a campaign that would handle that. campaign, you show a nice white screen, and everyone imagines what, oh, let's see if we can. <laughs> Here's another one. Today, technology has enabled us to connect and communicate with others in new ways. Sometimes fostering a connection is as simple as starting a conversation. The Cerebral Palsy Foundation asks for tips on having conversations with people with disabilities. To me, the easiest way to start is to just say hi. campaign is so powerful, someone who you might not typically put with Satya Nadella did one as well. At Apple, we believe inclusion inspires innovation. Diversity gives us strength. And that includes people with disabilities. The Cerebral Palsy Foundation asked me, what's the best way to strike up a conversation with someone who has a disability? It's easier than you think. But don't take my word for it. Hey, Siri. How do you start a conversation with someone who has a disability? It's easy. Just say hi. There you go. Reach out to someone with a disability. You can start by just saying hi. It does work all over the world. Feel free to do it. You know, although sometimes when you ask Siri, how do I get to the drugstore, it tells you what the capital of Zimbabwe is. So, um, <laughs> And again, we, we, the, the spot that you didn't get to see, uh, it was a compilation. It's on our website. But everybody from Mario Batali to William H. Macy to uh, Michael J. Fox did one for us, uh, Gail King, all sorts of folks. Um, and 
We're also including people with disabilities. Here's one from Zach Anner, one of my favorites. The Cerebral Palsy Foundation asked me how to start a conversation with someone with a disability. Well, I'll tell you what you don't do. Say, hey, what's wrong with you? But if you gotta ask, just ask in a cool way. Like, hey, what you got going on there? <laughs> or you could just say hi. That would be simple. You know, I'm just gonna, you know something? I talked before about persistence. Guys, it's only about persistence. I mean, I don't know Tim Cook, but I know some people at Apple and they believed in it. I don't know Satya, but I know that they want to do stuff about them. I was at the farmer's market in West Hampton and Michael J. Fox was there and I said, Michael, I know you have your own foundation, but will you do this for me? And he said yes. And I met Zach for the first time. We're really good friends now at a conference and he did it. When you ask for things, people will give them to you. We're also afraid to ask. It's not only that people don't want to do, but we're afraid to ask for things in a nice but persistent way. And we always forget that people don't know what we're asking for. That when you walk into a teacher and you say, I need, my kid has IDD and I need this and I need this and I need this. And as a school teacher, and they just don't really know because they haven't been given the training and we need to learn to work with people. It is really, it's wrong that they don't have it. It's terrible that they don't have it. But when you back someone into a corner, they don't get nice, they get scared. And our world scares people because they don't understand it. You know something, if you're a spelunker, you put something on your head and you walk into a cave and it's home. I walk into a cave and I'm scared to death about spiders. You know, <laughs> the world's scared to death of spiders. That's what I want you to all take away from it. <laughs> uh, but what does this have to do with technology? These spots are mostly shot on iPhones, they're emailed to us, they're spread through social media. We've gotten $10 million of free media from Tribune and from CBS, but we've gotten so much more from that, more value on that from the social media that these gone. And the social acceptance that it's creating is amazing. But what's even cooler is this, that what's really important is what comes after high. And it was created as a platform to continue these conversations. It addresses key moments in healthcare delivery. We're doing a project called Transforming Healthcare for Women with Disabilities, because when disability goes in for a mammogram, the technician doesn't know what to do, and they're scared, and they do a bad job, and it's awkward, and you don't get a good reading, and the woman never comes back. And because of that, women with disabilities, physical disabilities, have a three times higher fatality rate from breast cancer than other women. Three times higher. So we're put together groups of doctors, technicians, women with disabilities, and advocates, and we're coming up with a whole program to change that. And it's not medicine but we're gonna be able to spread it through technology because the technology allows us to share that message. We're building critical relationships outside our current community. All those people who are doing Just Say Hi campaigns, you know, that's partly why we have such a great relationship with Microsoft today. That's where it started. And most importantly, and one of the most exciting things that's ever happened is it is next year, th this year, we announced a pilot program in the New York City school system. We're in 10 pilot schools, Just Say Hi, is being embedded into the social studies curriculum as part of the school curriculum. <laughs> this is a presentation we made with Alex Brightman, star of School of Rock, whose dad started Apple's Worldwide Disability Group, imagine that, with the Chancellor Carmen Farina, with the Deputy Chancellor, Corrine Bello and Selmy has become a good friend, introducing this to those schools and telling them what they're doing. And next year, the plan is to roll this program out into every single school. 1.1 million people in New York City will see our kids and will say hi and will understand what they should say after that. And teachers will understand when you say hi, the kid needs a device or the ability or the time or the training to say the right thing back. And, we'll make, and it's not just a CP initiative, it's everything. Which sort of takes me back to this. To, to, to be there, what year is it? 15 years after this magazine, where there was a place in class for Tom, but no ability to teach him, was probably one of the most emotional moments I've ever had. Um, and things are happening because of that. But things are also happening because throughout Tom's life, he's had the support of good parents, 
support of many people like you out there who are here saying, how do we do things better? And one of the great joys of my life came a couple of, two, three months ago, when uh, Tom was in a little thing. He got to go to the White House with a theater group, and it was on TLC, and a uh, newscaster saw him and said, reached out to Tom and said, I want to do a video about you. And I had nothing to do with it. And this is what this looks like. you to a young man who has cerebral palsy. Well, now he's all grown up and he isn't letting his physical limits hold him back when it comes to his dreams. CBS 2's Cindy Shu has his inspiring story. Who wants to be the helper over here? Thomas? All right. We first met Thomas Ellenson 12 years ago when he was in kindergarten. He's now 18 in high school and his first love is acting. He's able to say his lines through a program called Total Talk. What is cerebral palsy? CP is an injury to the brain. I didn't have enough oxygen when I was born. While Thomas has limited movement and speech, cognitively, he's just like any other teenager. He types his words into this machine, which is then able to give those words sound. He dreams of acting on Broadway. I'm writing my own one-man show because I know people might not hire me otherwise. What do you want people to take away from your show? I want people to learn that people with disabilities are normal. See me, not see me. So see you, not cerebral palsy. He loves Broadway so much, he has a review website called Theaterific. I focus on the good in shows because people work really hard on them. So you're a theater critic with a heart. He can't even remember how many shows he's attended. One of his best friends is actor Christopher Hankey, who's been in four Broadway shows. Aww. Mm. Love you, buddy. Mm. If he wants to be on Broadway, he should be on Broadway. He has to fight, and if he's gonna, if he fights hard enough, he can do it. Desiree Valdez is another dear friend. They met four years ago in an acting program, and while they're now inseparable, Desiree remembers when they first met. I was like, oh my goodness, how am I gonna do this? Like, how are we gonna make scenes? Can he talk? Can, like, how does it work? It's worked just fine. I use this old chair, and we race around the house. Really? <laughs> What happened, Tom? I thought you were going to beat me. I asked Tom how he feels when he's acting on stage. He says he feels free. On the Upper East Side, Cindy Shu, CBS 2 News. Theater critic with a heart. I like oh that. Oh, gosh. Now, Tom's favorite show on Broadway is Fun Home. He says it's really deep, but also funny. He also let us know it's the first female team who wrote everything. Mm, a beautiful thing, huh? I would see a show, one-man show. I would. That's impressive. I think I'm going to cry. Yeah. Happy tears. Good guy. What Desi said there, first time I really heard her say that is like, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> That's what the world is thinking, I don't know what to do. As we look ahead, we need to acknowledge something clearly. The problem that we face is not a technology problem. It's a business problem, it's an economic problem, it's a regulatory and it's a social problem. The tech we need is out there. We just need to figure out how to make it ours. And so what we need to remember is that in this room, we are not just professionals, technologists, therapists, and parents. We are advocates, we are evangelists, and we are storytellers. And it is our job to tell not just the story of the challenges we have, but the story of the people with whom we spend so much of our lives. To tell stories not just of tech advance, toward which we're progressing at an amazing rate, but which don't necessarily have a projectable timeline. We need to tell stories about abilities of people, about joy, about accomplishment. We need to let others know not only of challenge and difficulty, but also of successes and triumphs and joys. It's our job not to just look toward our future, but to define the way the future is around us today. Before I end, I'm gonna ask you all to close your eyes for just one moment. Okay, now when I tell you to open them and keep them closed now, I will give you three seconds to find everybody in this room that is wearing something red, and then to close your eyes again. Open your eyes. One, two, three. Close them again. Now, while your eyes are closed, turn to the person on your right without opening your eyes and tell them, all the people in this room who are wearing green. <laughs> Life is like that. 
you find what you look for. Tomorrow's an odd concept. It's both the thing that happens in 24 hours and it's the thing that's always coming but never quite gets here. Today, the future is moving at an exponential rate, which means that if you look out onto the horizon, you might miss it. You need to look up. And that's wonderful. But let us also remember that the soul of the individual is every bit as important as the brain. And that the people and families we speak with every day will be affected by our narrative. Let's not forget how our embrace of the future we have today can create joy and acceptance in the homes that we will not always be allowed to see. And that by sharing hopes of things on the horizon only, we may be taking a person's gaze away from all that they have there, within their reach. So as we look off to this magical future, let us never lift our gaze so high that we miss all the amazing things standing right before us. Thanks very much. <laughs>